welcome back. I am really excited to be here and particularly thrilled to introduce our next speaker because she is someone I not only work with, extremely closely actually with, uh, who, and she's breaking ground, new ground for the American labor movement, but she's also my union sister. The relationship SAG-AFTRA has with the AFL-CIO is very important because when you set aside the glamorous trappings of the entertainment world or the notoriety of broadcasters, we represent, and it's so important to remember, we represent working people. And in order to do that with as much as we can, we rely on the support of the AFL-CIO's 12.5 million brothers and sisters and non-binary members. So it is our pleasure to do what we can to support them in return. We really depend on each other. When we, were, when we are united and deliberate, it's clear that we are much stronger and we need to be strong to confront the challenge, te technological challenges and the changes that are occurring. We need to be strong to recognize, shape and embrace the opportunities that are available. And I don't know anyone stronger than AFL-CIO Secretary Treasurer Liz Schuler. In her role, Liz is the second highest ranking officer in the American labor movement, the first woman elected to that position. Let me just say that again so you can really feel that, Liz. The first <laughs> woman elected to that position, as well as the youngest woman ever on the AFL-CIO's executive council. Liz's portfolio, which includes leading the AFL-CIO's technology and future of work initiatives is large because her mind and her energy are truly, truly boundless. Liz sees, as we do, that we must adapt new technologies to our own purpose in order to stay relevant to the next generation of workers and that we must harness innovation to organize workers and amplify the voice of working Americans. We are actually at a critical juncture in our nation's recovery. And there are so many questions left unanswered, but there's one question we know the answer to. Who's out there keeping the lights on? Who is out there educating our kids, putting food on their tables, caring for our sick and delivering all manner of essential services? And SAG-AFTRA, we're gonna plug it right here, keeping you entertained and informed, it's union members. So from my standpoint, there's absolutely no question that union members don't just have a place but are deriving the future of work. That's clear. So it is my high privilege and great honor to welcome Liz Schuler to share her vision on the future of work. Love having you here, Liz. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, and you said it, uh, all of those workers that are on the front lines and, and especially your members, and thank you for your visionary leadership. I mean it. Um, and to everyone at SAG-AFTRA for your partnership, um, this is our second summit together, and I am so thrilled to be a part of it. And I think the timing couldn't be more critical. Um, so let's jump right in. So we are in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution. And each revolution is shaped by at least three things. One, technological breakthroughs. Two, innovation and how that technology is used to change work. And the third piece is the most important and that's workers and how we organize to shape it. And the labor movement as we know it today, the power of collective bargaining was born as an innovation response to industrial change. And we have been innovating ever since. So from steam mills and coal mines to automobile factories and modern cockpits in offices and through automation, the labor movement has always been the vehicle for turning technological advances into better living standards and, and better wages. But now this fourth industrial revolution, as they call it, is speeding toward us and breakthroughs are happening faster than ever, changing life and work in every sector healthcare, education, grocery, construction, transportation, and more. And all of this has been accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's raising big questions about the future of work, innovation policy, algorithms, data privacy. All of these are now urgently in front of us. And the labor movement really is the only force or institution at scale in the country with enough power to put workers at the center of these issues. So next slide. 
the trade policy shifts and globalization that has happened in the last 30 years have decimated American manufacturing and moved jobs overseas. And there has been a major economic shift in our country. And now five tech companies comprise almost 20% of the S&P 500. That's right, I said five tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. And big tech is the single biggest growth factor in the US economy where there is almost no union presence. And because there aren't any unions, there's a mega power imbalance in tech. And it's bleeding over into other sectors as the tools that big tech create exacerbate the problem like surveillance and data collection. So what do I mean? Well, let's talk about some examples. Next slide. Amazon. Amazon is the quintessential case study. Let's start with data. You hear the saying, I know I do, that data is the new oil, right? It's a commodity. It is power. And that is why employers collect it. Amazon collects data on workers through scanners, through wristbands, thermal cameras, how far you walk, how long you're in the bathroom, every move of the wrist literally monitored and recorded. And Amazon even patented a wristband because, and this is actually from the patent, it says tracking of a worker's hands may be used to monitor performance. So it's dehumanizing. And that's the next point here is workers say this level of control turns them into zombies. It's dangerous. Workers are forced to accomplish tasks at unforgiving rates. Uh, in 2018, a reporter found that 10% of full-time workers suffered serious injuries. That is more than twice the national average. And it's not just warehouse workers. Drivers have to deliver, get this, 999 out of every 1,000 packages have to be delivered on time. Imagine the pressure and what that translates to on the road as we're all driving around. So that brings us to another point. Where does that employee surveillance data go? Well, it goes into an automated management system. And that system can issue warnings, it can even fire workers, all with no human interaction. And now we're seeing Amazon weaponize data for union busting. They're identifying and moving employees around to prevent union organizing. And despite that, or maybe because of it, we're seeing an historic union drive at the Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama. Have you been watching this? So exciting, voting is underway, we are hopeful. This is already a total game changer, no matter what the outcome, it is redefining what is possible. Next slide. So to put things in perspective, consider Jeff Bezos. He's a household name, right? He's stepping down as Amazon CEO, but of course he is still going to have a strong hand in the company's decisions, right? So let's look at his wealth at scale. This slide attempts to show how Jeff Bezos' wealth stacks up against everyone else, okay? We're using this animated graph. Each pixel, those notches at the bottom on the screen are representing millions of dollars. So you can see that tiny dot on the far left that represents a thousand dollars. And then the small green square on the right is $1 million. And then as the animation is going, this is Jeff Bezos' wealth flying by, right? Each 10 pixels is $5 million. So what is the point? Well, the point is we are not even gonna get to the end because his wealth is so vast. So as I'm talking, it's still going, right? So we won't wait for it to get to the end. You get the point. So next slide. This is what happens when technology is used to exploit workers. The gains, they're not shared. The imbalance of power and wealth is staggering. And we're supposed to celebrate when Amazon goes to a $15 an hour floor for its workers? 
And I would argue the major reason this happens is because there's no union to bargain their fair share of the wealth with the what the workers themselves are creating, right? So at least not yet. And as the new CEO, Andy Jassy, uh, starts to take on his, his role, um, he was the head of Amazon Web Services. And that is a whole new world of concerns. Let's go to the next slide. What is Amazon Web Services, AWS? Well, that is Amazon's cloud. It sells computing power, storage, tools. It is just um, uh, a small part of Amazon, right? No, <laughs> Amazon Web Services profited a cool $15.3 billion in 2020. That is 65% of Amazon's revenue. It's not an exaggeration to say that its reach is everywhere, all over the internet, major corporations, Unilever, GE, Shell, Apple, big banks, academia, 6,500 government agencies are using it. How we're connecting right now, Zoom. Zoom runs through AWS. And the power of this monopoly is so overwhelming. Mark Perone talks about this all the time. Even the labor movement hasn't been able to get around it. We end up using AWS for our databases as well. And AWS has totally enabled the gig economy. Now this is important because not only does Amazon, Amazon exploit their own workers who work for them, they're enabling worker exploitation in sectors all across the economy. They're profiting tremendously from the emergence of low wage platform work in the gig economy. For example, AWS has enabled the rise of gig platforms like Uber, Lyft, Instacart, TaskRabbit. They've all used AWS to scale up their businesses. And these companies are using, you guessed it, algorithms data run technology to nickel and dime workers. So DoorDash, probably familiar with them. They claimed that their workers make $18.54 per active hour. Okay, well, a study actually found that after expenses, take home pay per real hour was more like $1.45 an hour. So the way these companies get away with this is by misclassifying their workers as independent contractors. So they get less pay, little if any benefits, and no job security, all while doing the same work as full-time employees. And this is a racial justice issue because black and brown workers are disproportionately working in these jobs. Next slide. And people often forget that this technology actually came from your tax dollars. Yes, government investment in research is what created these technological breakthroughs and innovation. And that is a good thing. But if we're collectively investing in research and development, then the profits and gains from these discoveries should also be shared collectively. And it should benefit working people and lead to good jobs, especially in the supply chain so that manufacturing can grow again as we innovate. And workers' voices and perspectives should be included at every step of the innovation process. Because we know, especially those of us in the labor movement, partnerships that center working people's experiences in the innovation process lead to better outcomes, equity, safety, and higher wage jobs. Just look at what's happening even in our own government with innovation policy, agencies like the National Science Foundation, Departments of Transportation, Homeland Security, Agriculture. They have all launched National Artificial Intelligence Research Institutes or AI Research Institutes. And I just saw recently the launch of an Institute for AI and Construction. And of course, coming from IBW, I was like, oh, wow, AI and Construction that has like 40 partners. And then I'm looking at, no, doesn't include a single building trades union. There is no worker voice. So this is hopefully where the Biden administration can help us. And he is very serious about including workers at the table. 
Next slide. So Google is an example of a company that was made possible with public funding. And it's an example of how the technology we use is based on what just a few powerful people decide. And you may have heard recently that several engineers at the company tried to organize a union to protest the bias in the algorithms used in Google searches. And of course, they were illegally fired shortly thereafter. And the day that the NLRB filed the complaint against the company for illegally firing these engineers, Google fired Timney Gebru, a champion for black women in tech and an esteemed researcher. And she was the one standing up and speaking out about the harm that algorithms can cause communities of color. And here's what she was talking about. I'm gonna show you two searches in Google. And one of them you see here, um, you, when you search the term, when did humans, the word humans come to America? You get an answer that considers ancient indigenous peoples and cultures, okay? The next slide, when you change the word humans to people and search, when did people come to America? You get a different answer. One that frames history through the lens of colonization. It erases indigenous history and perspective. Next slide. So here is the difference side by side. Imagine how this impacts what our kids are learning when the bias confuses the facts. And that is happening through Google, all the searches that we do every day right now. And what is encoded into these platforms matters because everyone who is using them, their perspective and their understanding is being shaped by this. And there's no incentive, if you think about it, for Timney who stood up, right? There's no incentive for a powerful CEO to listen to someone like her, to the tech experts and workers. The only way we can change that is by putting real power behind workers' voices. And the best way to do that is through labor unions. Next slide. And this is where I get excited. This is the uplifting part. You probably heard about CWA code, which announced the Alphabet Workers Union with workers at Google. This is the first union in tech to be open to everyone. Engineers and custodians, employees, contractors, they are already making an impact. Just a day or two after launching in the wake of the assault on the US Capitol, Alphabet Workers Union pressured YouTube to deplatform former President Trump. Those in SAG-AFTRA may remember, that's the guy who violated your constitution <laughs> and resigned his membership before he could be expelled, right? And there are more examples of union organizing in tech. CWA Code recently announced the Medium Workers Union, Kickstarter workers that made a breakthrough last year by joining OPEIU. And so did the steel workers who organized Google, um, the contractor HCL uh, in Pittsburgh. We need to keep organizing and we need to learn how we can organize with and around tech. Next slide. So what are we seeing here? Yes, it's an x-ray. Skilled technicians and radiologists read these every day. It takes about 13 years to become a radiologist. But there is an AI program that has discovered markers for breast cancer that human doctors never saw. So what's gonna happen? Will AI replace those doctors? Or will doctors who know how to use AI replace those who don't? The point here is that these technology issues do not just affect certain types of jobs. They affect all jobs and technology is going to have a huge impact on workers at every skill level in every field. And workers are going to need a way to protect themselves and get the skills that it will that will take them to the next job. And once again, that's where the union comes in, right? Making sure that all workers have a union is how we disrupt the disruption. And that's why we absolutely need to pass the PRO Act, the legislation that's going to restore our ability to organize with coworkers so we can negotiate pay and benefits 
and technology. Next slide. And Unite Here, our powerhouse hotel and hospitality union affiliate, you probably remember bartenders, servers, room attendants, mostly women of color, stood up to Marriott and went on strike at one of the biggest hotel chains in the world. And they won, they won protection so they would not be displaced by technology like automated guest check-in systems. And more than that, they won innovative tools to keep workers safe. And you see those devices in their hands, those are panic buttons. And when they face an unruly guest or an unsafe condition as they're cleaning rooms, they press that button for help. And because it's such a powerful way for workers to be empowered in the face of harassment, Vox actually called this panic button one of the greatest victories of the Me Too movement. Next slide. Another example of negotiating on tech is the NFL Players Association. They kept power on the side of players by signing a contract with a wearable device that tracks health and performance data. But here's the key. Players, not the league, control this data. And it's because they bargained for that control using their collective bargaining process. So what's clear from these examples is we can be savvy. We can be forward looking. And if we educate workers and the public on technology and secure stronger tech bargaining language in our union contracts, we can definitely influence the future of work in ways that have real impact. Next slide. And for all of those reasons, we are so excited. We have our new Technology Institute launched. It's gonna serve as the labor movement's think tank and laboratory. And we're gonna look at where the disruptions are really happening and what policies workers need. What kind of safeguards and training will workers need to make sure tech enhances our work and our lives instead of degrading them? What new industries are emerging? And how do we use our union's deep industry expertise to make the policy demands and make sure there's a worker voice at those tables of power? So let there be no doubt the labor movement is positioning for the future. And just look at those 5,600 workers in Bessemer, Alabama and Amazon who are standing together because everyone is watching and what they're seeing is inspiring. Next slide. And to finish where I began, Every industrial revolution involves the technology itself, innovation and how it transforms work, and most importantly, the workers and how we shape it. And I believe the labor movement will be what translates these industrial revolutions into cultural and societal progress and the future will be what we make of it. Thank you and back to you, Gabrielle.